Yeah, um, hi. Uh, and now for something completely different. Um, it's, uh, thanks, Annette, by the way, for responding to my article. It was indeed very nice to have a, a dialogue um, on so many levels, and I'm already buzzing with everything I've heard so far. Um, so I have to sort of switch a button a bit to my own work again. Um, uh, I was really asked to not do a PowerPoint um, because clearly we wanted to have our work speak for itself. However, the work that I present here is partly coffee corner and partly incomplete. So I felt it was to share some of the things that are partly virtual uh, to use a virtual screen to, to give you a, an insight on this a little bit more. Uh, so thank Denise for being flexible and letting me do this. Um, so I consider myself a mixed reality designer and researcher, and that's basically because nobody knows what that means. And it affords me a lot of space to experiment uh, within the domain of mixed reality. Um, I just started my um, uh, research project uh, in September, um, and it's called Creative Processes in Collaborative Mixed Reality Environments. And the second sentence might be something you understand better, which is to stimulate invention and innovation through improvisation. I'm also based at the School uh, of Theater uh, at the HKU, so that might explain a little bit how I approach the idea of improvisation. And what I'm interested in is using technology as part of the design process rather than as an outcome. So I'm very interested in how technologies and mixed reality technologies can actually be used in a very early stage of conceptualization, of ideation, in, in collaboration, as a way to sketch and then physically, basically experience those sketches together. And I will get into that a little bit more. Um, I, I've used the word mixed reality now uh, already, I think, seven times. So just to give you some idea of what I mean by that is that I love the, the already from the 90s uh, Paul Milgram's virtuality continuum idea of mixed reality. There's a lot of terms being used lately because of industry, like XR and AR and VR. Uh, what I like is, is MR, and that's because mixed reality is basically a scale between the completely real and completely virtual. Now we can have long discussions about what is real and not. Let's not do that for now. I only have like 12 minutes left. But uh, what I like about the idea of a scale is that we're not fixated with a certain device or a certain singular experience, but you're actually designing experiences possibly over time that move over this scale back and forth which I think is actually much more realistic. When you enter VR, it's not that the experience starts when you put the helmet on, the experience already starts when you enter the building, or depending on where you feel uh, you're tuning into the ex actual experience. So there's always this notion of moving back and forth on this virtuality scale. So the project I wanna talk about is this one. That was a 30-second time-lapse of a full day of uh, 36Q at the Prague Quadrennial. Uh, the Prague Quadrennial, you, you might know, it's a once in four years uh, um, gathering of scenographers or theater designers and architects uh, who, uh, from all countries who exchange their work. And uh, the 36Q project has already been initiated four years ago as an experimental space to combine all sorts of different media uh, and, and sort of see how, you, how the space itself could sort of in an atmospheric way uh, or in a poetic way become an experiential space rather than using a text or uh, a performance as, as such. So it's more like a performative space, I would say. Um, we were situated in an ice skating hall and um, the concept was initiated uh, by uh, Marketa Vantova, the artistic leader of the PQ, and she asked Romain Tardy, which is a light designer, to come up with the first concept. So what he did was to in introduce the idea of 36 water pools and have two scaffolding structures and then have a lot of lights and sound and all sorts of media. And then on top of that, we had like uh, several working groups that would then start making an, an, a macro experience uh, which we then were situated within the context of the blue hour. Now, um, the thing is we had video projection mapping, lighting design, sound design, tactile envir environment, system integration work group, an experimental sound work group, and the black sheep in the, in the, the theater technology uh, range, the augmented and virtuality work group, and I was one of those. Um, so 
basically what you end up uh, with is that you you could walk in uh, in Prague of course there were several venues that you could visit and you would sort of walk around and it was like in June so it was like really summer day and then you you uh, from like 25 degree environment uh, can move towards this this hallway and it already uh, when you get closer starts to produce like sounds and and atmospheres so it's like entering almost like a dungeon <laughs> Uh, in contrast with this summery day. Um, oh, that was completely the wrong slide. Sorry about that. Um. <laughs> I will try it by hand. So when you enter the space, um, you basically enter an environment um, that is completely uh, using all sorts of media. And um, you literally sort of go physically down into this experience. So here you see the space. And every 24 minutes, uh, it would do a cycle of lights and sounds. And, uh, and you could sort of wander around. It would run for 10 hours a day. And people could sort of explore those spaces. And within that space, we sort of had four VR installations. So you see here the contraption. And you see a physical sand pool and people were asked to take their shoes off and then put the helmet on and step into the sand and have the VR experience. And of course we put a little light on it because when people are doing VR they're actually quite performative. They're very beautiful to look at I think. So it was not only about what you see in VR again. They were also part of the actual uh, 36Q environment. All right. So. Um, what is very important is that we really used uh, the venue itself. So basically, I sort of modeled the whole space, the architectural building, into VR as well. So when you put the VR on, you see the same space that you're basically in. Um, and in that sense, it was uh, really not only site-specific, but really site-responsive, because it was responding also to the audio and the thing that was going on in the physical space. So unfortunately, it's a work that we can only show uh, uh, once <laughs> in Prague back then in that particular moment. So it's a bit weird and strange and very confronting to have my VR-only version here, but I'll reflect on that a, a little bit more. Now, the VR piece itself, you see this virtual pool being uh, duplicated, uh, and when you pick up the lantern, uh, it triggers off basically the experience. So here you see the architectural space being uh, re um, Redesign or yeah, you say that uh, reconstructed in VR, and um, then we do a lot of stuff. We pick you up and we basically move you through the roof of that virtual building, which is exactly what you shouldn't do in VR, uh, because it makes people really sick. If you move them around in a virtual space while they're physically standing still, it's the perfect recipe for disaster. Um, so that was one of the design challenges, but we really wanted to leave the space to end up in a video space. Oh, sorry. Damn. Again, the wrong keyboard shortcut. That's the problem if you... Where am I? Huh. It's a bit chaotic presentation like this, huh? Um, well, anyway, so we pull you through the roof and you end up in a, uh, some uh, um, video worlds that was actually made by my colleague. Now, the thing is, in VR, uh, the body is really central to the experience. And you're not just a spectator or an audience. You're really fully engaged with your whole body within the experience. So when you design such experiences, you have to take that into account. And so we had not only a physical installation, including the sand, we didn't, uh, we had a physical object that you could literally almost hold on to that re would represent also your, your hand in space. Uh, but we also combined 360 uh, um, video with real-time 3D graphics. And people tend to say that that is all VR. Well, it's a fundamentally different kind of VR. Whether you're looking in a video bubble or you're having real-time 3D graphics that respond to your movements, it's quite a difference. Um, I'm looking at my time, so we're going to speed up a little bit. The thing was, I, I reconstructed the architectural building into the VR as well, and then on top of that, you could choose those video worlds. So I really, really want to um, 
invite you, but there's a lot of people here, so that's an interesting one, to really have the experience yourself. You can look at movies forever. It would never do justice to the actual experience. Uh, so we had a lot of challenges, one being motion sickness. Other one is how to uh, keep people safe and feel, in a way, uh, taken care of, which, again, in the coffee corner is already becoming a challenge. Um, so th there's a lot to this that is not only about the virtual design, but also the design and taking care of the person who goes through it. The point I want to make for this presentation, which has to do with experimentation and, and, and how you can use experience as part of your experimentation for design in VR is this. We have built all sorts of um, live controls so we could basically puppeteer all the interactions in the virtual space before we would decide on the programming and the algorithm. So all the things we've done is in an early stage connect all sorts of virtual aspects like the physical device he would hold, the, the ledge of the pool that was not built yet, um, also the whole contraption of the virtual pool that he is in that we can sort of move around. All of them we connected to live controls. So basically my, um, my programmer and now also puppeteer could live puppeteer all the uh, different variables as we call them. So how fast do you move? When do portals appear? What if you move back and forth? Uh, do they open up? Do they get closer or smaller? And by live puppeteering, uh, which is of course coming from, this is me telling Paul <laughs> what is not there yet. And um, so it's what we're used to in theater to sort of improvise partly already in an early stage and see how it feels rather than conceptualize and have a whole script and then start making it. So I think this is one of the key things I wanted to really show you uh, that when you do something virtual that is actually a very embodied experience, it's super important to build contraptions where you in an early stage can physically relate to the design that you are attempting. And a lot of course our assumptions, even with all my years of experience with VR, were wrong the moment we sort of to try them out. So a lot of design through experience literally changed. So I have three and a half minutes for conclusions. Some of our findings, uh, well, we had about 500 performance designers or theater designers going through this experience in the 10 days that we showcased this work. And they're very critical designers, and they're also very critical in using technology. Uh, so I was super scared. Um, but I managed to sort of stay there and listen to the, the feedback that I got. And to my great surprise, I'm not a theater designer myself, they were actually super enthusiastic. And I think it has to do with a few things. One of them, we really took care of them uh, what we call in the phase of onboarding. So we had trained volunteers really taking care of you, sitting down, letting your back uh, be somewhere safe, taking your shoes off, you had time to actually watch what you would get into. Uh, there were all sorts of like precise instructions that were not too much, but you really feel like you're in a safe space. And this is important because you're actually very vulnerable when you put a VR helmet on. We basically make you deaf and blind. So this is part of the design that has nothing to do with computers and everything about the human aspect and the human uh, social aspect of the design. You need to give people time to also get used to the experience. And then talking about this instability, uh, and this is what I really noticed now here also, people get a bit wobbly. And this is why we designed the whole sand pool. Uh, because we already felt we wanted to really let you connect with your whole body to sort of root you in the experience. And the sand is actually counterintuitive because it's an instable surface. Uh, but to our surprise and partly also to our assumption, it actually worked really well. Because if you're not stable, your whole body is constantly recalibrating its balance. And for that reason, you stay very embodied in your own body, while meanwhile we take your head and pull it through the roof. So we were anchoring the experience by literally connecting to your bare feet in the sand. These are material aspects of VR design that people tend to forget. And you will probably notice if you're here with your shoes on and you're already full of coffee and thinking, it might actually not help when you're doing VR because it destabilizes you. Another aspect of this is that I think uh, sitting down in the, in, on the chair, both before you would go in, but also after you had the experience, everybody really felt the need to share or contemplate. So it's very important to also create a space where it's not like, okay, thank you, now you can move. <laughs> but you have people to, to, to give them a space to sit down. There's only one chair less because uh, every other chair we're now using, but that these are aspects that we, we, we try to incorporate. I don't know what this sound is, is it me? No. Um, all right. <laughs> 
Um, another thing is, is that I was very skeptical about 360 video for quite some time because I feel it's a linear medium, it has nothing to do with live interaction. But to our surprise, hybrid forms of using both 360 video with real-time 3D graphics worked really well. So um, I'm super excited to explore this a little bit further. And now, um, <laughs> being here, it's very confronting because, of course, it's lacking the sand pool, it's lacking my volunteers, it's lacking the onboarding scheme, it's lacking the whole building with all the sounds and images. So you have this VR-only version here that does in no way justice to the mixed reality approach that we had. So Paul and I were very reluctant to actually showcase this piece as a VR-only piece. But we did it anyway, because we wanted to actually see how it contrasts. So we want to know whether it actually matters whether you have the sand pool or not, whether it matters you're in that physical space or not. And in this case, how much of the experience is still being left. That was the sign. I also have a sign here. Final remark then is a new hypermedium is a hybrid approach. So this is not a single discipline of animation or gaming or whatever. It's a multimedial and thus also an interdisciplinary approach. And I think we need new terms actually, probably, uh, to name uh, these fields uh, and disciplines. Thank you very much.